from governess to blue stocking. Written by Edith Bird and published by Starfall Publications. Available on our website. Save more by purchasing our bundles. Enjoy. Chapter One. The first buds of spring ought to have been a joyous occasion for all in the London environs. They brought with them a thaw from the unrelenting winter, the aroma of romance, and the whispered promise of the summer season. Yet for Stephen Thayer, the Duke of Richmond's disconsolate son, who looked down at the blooming gardens from the second floor window of his father's grand estate, the bright green shoots coming up from the cool earth could only mean one thing. Mother will be on again about my marriage, he said curtly, turning to address his valet. The servant, a pale little man in proper livery, looked up with a sparkle in his eyes. I am impressed by Lady Richmond's endurance of the topic, he said. Mr. Carl Smith, commonly referred to as Smith in the house, had been Stephen's valet for years and knew his master's complaints well. It is easy for her to endure when she has my father's full support. Stephen walked to the free form where Smith was dusting off the shoulders of his morning coat. And now I am expected to appear at breakfast with the robins echoing their tune of love. Smith pulled the coat off the form and helped his master into it, adjusting the collar carefully and stepping back to survey his work. Stephen was of medium height, although strongly built so as to appear taller than he was upon first introduction. He had long red hair, nearly to his shoulders, dark brown eyes, and a well-trimmed beard that his mother absolutely detested. You look like a farmer, she'd always said, or worse, a poet. Smith frowned as he examined the coat. This is a bit out of fashion now, my lord, he marked thoughtfully. The lapels are double-notched now. You ought to let me call up your tailor and make some changes. As I have no intention of appearing in France at present, Stephen replied with a brief smile, I suppose my crimes of fashion will be overlooked for the time being. Do not suppose too quickly, Smith said, his face sober, but his tone filled with gentle humour. One would not have to travel to France to see double-notched lapels. I'm sure your own father has a proper morning coat now, and he is one who clings to the old ways, he continued. Stephen raised his eyebrows at his valet. He was well used to the servant speaking his mind, as long as respect and proper diligence were maintained. However, the reminder of his father's adherence to tradition only brought back to mind the problem at hand. His parents, Lord and Lady Richmond, had only him as a son and heir, and seeing him approach the sophisticated age of six and twenty, were quite concerned that he had not yet entertained any marriage prospects. They were already lining up the ladies of the ton, attempting to discreetly insert names and attributes of the fair damsels into common conversation. Stephen was not fooled. He had been to a dinner party only two nights past, where he found himself face to face with yet another dimpled beauty at every turn. Each fought to capture him with their smiles and coy remonstrations, but the more affectionate they appeared, the more he wanted to escape. If my father would only give me time, he said, more to himself than to Smith. It was a comment unconnected from Smith's discussion of fashion, but the valet seemed to understand perfectly and merely nodded silently. There came at the door a quick double rap and then the butler, Oliver, let himself in. Are you quite ready, my lord? he asked. Lord and Lady Richmond are in the breakfast room, requesting your presence. I am aware, Stephen answered, drawing himself up and bowing his head briefly to the butler. I was finishing up my bathroom routine. The butler hovered a moment and then, looking uncomfortable, added, Lord Richmond asked that I escort you downstairs personally. Ah, Stephen thought. He doesn't want me to have a chance to escape the conversation through tardiness or other means. Of course, he said aloud, hoping his frustration didn't show in his words. It was unprofessional and unkind to allow servants into one's family troubles. His frankness with Smith was not preferable, but over the years a polite friendship had formed between the two. Even so, he tried to keep his own business separate from that of the staff as much as possible. It was for their good, as well as his. 
It was a thoroughly unpleasant thing for a servant to become entangled in the political and relational affairs of their master, quite confusing for all involved, as his father had always told him. He followed Oliver down, leaving his valet behind to tidy the room and set things out for the evening. The breakfast room was a fine open space with wide windows and plenty of natural light. In fact, prior to the ad nauseum where his parents brought up the marriage scene, Stephen would have thoroughly enjoyed the prospect of a peaceful morning meal in such a place. Lord and Lady Richmond, dressed in fine silks as always, looked up in unison when he entered the room. Stephen, his father spoke first, we were worried you wouldn't be joining us. I had hoped you were out late last night at Lady Raymond's card party, Lady Richmond interjected, tapping her spoon against her boiled egg as though to appear disinterested. If you needed your rest after a particularly pleasant evening, we would have understood. Stephen could see she was fishing for information, but pretended not to have guessed, taking his seat at the other side of the table and helping himself to some toast. It was a fine evening, he said, although I did not stay late. I had no desire to lose my money, and the stakes went high rather too quickly for my tastes. Stakes? his mother asked, her disappointment evident. If he was speaking of stakes, he would have been off in some dingy study with the gentleman, gambling far away from the simpering ladies she was hoping he would fall in love with. Yes, just a bit of loo on the side, but I could see a few captain sharks planning to steal the night, and I have no desire to be fleeced. He buttered his toast and poured himself a cup of tea. How was your evening? Ignoring the question, his mother pressed. Were there any young ladies there of note? She hurried to cover the question. I ask for societal reasons, of course. I wish to know if it was an affair I ought to have attended. Stephen looked up at her, keeping a smile at bay. There was cigar smoking in the gentleman's gaming room, he said briefly. I hardly think you or any lady would be expected in such a place. Lord Richmond cleared his throat. You are teasing your mother, he said, but she has a right to ask such questions. Will you continue in your bachelor ways for eternity? We are simply looking out for your best interest, and it is high time you show a little responsibility. Father, Stephen answered calmly, I have shown the utmost responsibility. For years now I have followed in your footsteps caring for the business of the estate in greater and greater magnitude, until your daily duties are all but gone. How would a wife make me any more responsible? You have a duty to uphold our lineage, Lord Richmond said firmly. I know it is not a subject upon which you like to reflect, but the truth is there regardless. Personally, I fail to see why you are so resistant to the idea. A fine young lady would improve your life, not detract from it. This seemed to be just the opening Lady Richmond was hoping for, because she brightened considerably and set down her teacup with a little clatter. Truly you speak aright, she said to her husband, for I was only just talking with Lady Elliot about her daughter, a Miss Carolyn Elliot, who is newly arrived on the social scene. She cast a significant glance in Stephen's direction. This will be her very first season, and I assure you she is promised to be quite the catch. I have heard she is beautiful beyond comparison, and well-liked in the social circles she has inhabited prior to her official introduction. She took a deep breath, and Stephen wondered if she was finished. But of course she was not. She has a lovely voice, it is rumoured, and has put effort into her needlework as well. Stephen nodded. I know Miss Elliot, he said. I met her by happenstance at an ice cream parlour two weeks past. But I do not think you will like the story, he added mentally. You did not say, his mother exclaimed, you ought to invite her to tea. Lord Richmond, however, seemed to know his son better. You didn't approve of her, he said, studying Stephen's face. What fault could you have found with such a creature? It's her first season, as you said. Stephen explained, remembering the tedious conversation they'd shared in the ice cream parlour. She's very young and knows little of the world. You would hardly want a worldly woman, Lady Richmond said with astonishment, 
and you wouldn't want a lady in her third or fourth season, the dregs of what society has to offer. Stephen sighed, feeling suddenly tired. We spoke of things with no import, the weather, the newest fashions, a passing carriage horse in need of a shoe. It was hardly the sort of conversation to encourage interest. If Lady Richmond's exasperation had not been so disappointing, Stephen would have been tempted to laugh. She raised her hands weakly. I don't understand what you want, Stephen, she said. Would you have her speak of war and politics like a man of work? Lord Richmond cleared his throat. If you are not interested in Miss Elliot, he said, then perhaps you could allow your mother to invite Miss Pembleton or Miss Martin over. You know that they are both in line for fine things and have excellent prospects. They are a bit older than Miss Elliot, but only by a year or so. They will hardly be considered old maids yet. I should hope not, at the ripe old age of nineteen, Stephen said. He took a sip of tea to calm his thoughts, and set his cup down on the saucer with precision, pausing a moment to make certain his tone was kind before he spoke. I know what you wish of me, Mother Father. I know what is expected of me. But this endless parade of eligible ladies is driving me further from the goal of marriage. He shook his head. I have met no one I would wish to spend the rest of my life with. You aren't looking for a friend, his father said gently. You needn't be certain that the woman in question has good conversation and is pleasant for passing the time. Marriage can be a matter of convenience and as long as the woman you choose is not a villain, comfort and happiness are attainable. Stephen could not think of a response, so completely did his wishes differ from those of his parents. They are happily married, he thought miserably, and yet they speak to me as though I can make do with less than they themselves enjoy. He was saved from having to voice these thoughts, however, by the appearance of Oliver in the doorway. The butler cleared his throat. I am sorry to interrupt, my lord, he said, directing his words at Stephen's father. But a most urgent letter has just arrived from March Manor. I would not have disturbed you, but the attached missive said to deliver it to you with the utmost haste. Stephen sat up with interest. He knew hardly anything about March Manor, other than the simple fact that his mother's sister lived there. He knew her name, Lady Cecilia Cuddle, the Dowager Duchess of March, and that his parents were not especially close with her. In fact, his father now picked up the letter from the proffered silver tray with a look of marked disapproval. He looked at it a moment, and then laid it on the table in front of him. Stefan was surprised. Did Oliver not tell us the missive was most urgent? He asked pointedly. Surely we ought to read it at once. I know what it says, Lord Richmond said. He looked up briefly at Stephen's mother, the two sharing a knowing glance. It can wait. How do you know what it says? Stephen pressed. This was a level of intrigue and mystery that was quite unexpected in his parents. He didn't know quite what to make of it. We've already received three letters of its kind, Lady Richmond interjected, looking uncomfortably down at her plate. I assure you the matter is not as urgent as Oliver made it seem. Stephen waited a moment more, expecting to have more light shed on the matter, but as his parents resumed eating in conspicuous silence, he realised the matter would have to fall to him. He reached quickly across the table, and before his father had even noticed the letter was gone, slit the seal neatly with his butter knife and opened the letter. Stephen, his mother said, looking up with alarm, I assure you, these theatrics are entirely unnecessary. He was not listening, his mind otherwise absorbed in the contents of the letter. To Lord and Lady Richmond, regarding the circumstances of your sister, the Dowager Duchess of March. I have written previously to tell you of your sister's deteriorating state of health and my concerns for her well-being. I have unfortunately received no reply, and therefore feel compelled to introduce myself again, lest the previous letters have been lost in the post. I am Mr. Tyler, Lady Cecilia's butler and the current manager of her grounds. Her agent at present is not aware of her condition. I have taken great pains to keep it thusly. She is getting older and has been failing in health for some time. She seems frail and distracted, 
and I'm no longer able to keep her safe and free of scandal. Her behaviour is at times quite erratic. Please, send word on how I should proceed. It is my belief that she is in need of serious help, and my additional belief that she would wish her family to know and give aid. She has said before that she has no one else in the world but you. Please write back with instructions. Your humble servant, Mr. Tyler of March Manor. Stephen set down the letter, looking up in disbelief at his parents, who had stopped eating and were watching him read the missive with obvious trepidation. You knew about this? he asked, incredulous. It says she has no one in the world but us and she needs help. How could you have avoided these letters for so many weeks? It seems her situation is deteriorating, and we, her family, are doing nothing to stop it. You do not fully understand the circumstances of our relationship with Aunt Cecilia, Lady Richmond said quickly, dusting her hands together as though to push the conversation away. It is not us who chose to avoid her. She chose to avoid us. The Dowager Duchess chose to live alone all these years. No one was forcing solitude upon her. Her butler is writing us, most untoward, I must say. And so I can assure you, if we showed up on the steps of March Manor, he would immediately get the sack and we would be sent away. Cecilia will brook no guest to stay in her house, even if she is sick. You can't know that, Stephen said. How can they be so heartless, he wondered. It was unlike his parents to be cold or distant, and here they had written proof that there was a family member in need whom they were ignoring. There must be more to this story, he thought. Perhaps her situation has changed, and she would indeed appreciate companionship. He shrugged. Perhaps she is too proud to ask for it. Suddenly a thought came to him, a solution to both the problem in the letter and his own worries about the upcoming season. I shall go to stay with her, he said suddenly, pushing back from his seat at the table and standing. I will care for her until she is well again. Lord Richmond laughed briefly. Don't be ridiculous, Stephen, he said. You have only just learned of her plight, and you have absolutely no history with the woman. She wouldn't let you stay more than two minutes. I'm not sure she'll have a choice, he said, reading from the letter. It says here that she is frail, and her behaviour is erratic. Perhaps she will be forced to accept the support of family, now that she is no longer able to support herself. I would not place your hopes on it, Lady Richmond said. And besides, you have enough to worry about here. This letter has taken us away from our previous conversation about your future, and I fear you will run off in some rash endeavour, leaving all marriage prospects behind. My hope exactly, Stephen thought with amusement. My mind is quite made up, he said to his parents. I know this will seem abrupt. It seems thusly even to myself. But I think when such an urgent request is delivered, it is not for us to put it in a back drawer. We must help Aunt Cecilia. If you will not go, I will. His parents exchanged a brief, exasperated glance. They were not happy with it, but Stephen saw them giving in. He knew there would be more protests and exclamations as he went about packing for the trip, but in that one shared glance he saw that they were giving in for the time being. Right then, he said, I will set out at first light tomorrow. Chapter 2 March Manor was not at all as Stephen had imagined it. When he at last pulled into the drive after a rattling, exhausting carriage ride, he was pleasantly impressed by the size and scope of the lands. He had heard of the manor in only distant terms, as people spoke of their country homes, and considering his reclusive aunt's reputation, had imagined a dilapidated cottage of the sort used for winter hunting trips. In truth, the grounds were well kept up. There were sheep grazing the lawns, beautiful trees bending in welcome over the gravel drive, and a few well-kept ponds glistening in the light. The house itself was monstrous, a fine stone place with three stories of elegance and a great marble staircase leading up to the door. Stephen stepped out of the carriage and motioned to Smith to carry his bags inside. Do you know what room you will be in, my lord? Smith asked. 
He was taking the abrupt change in stride, but Stephen knew his valet disapproved of spontaneous journeys. We are not expected, Stephen admitted, a little sheepishly. But I will speak with the butler and see that your duties are made as simple as possible. Smith waited at the carriage to unload the luggage while Stephen climbed the stairs to the door. He didn't have to knock. It was already standing open, and in the doorway a slim old man in fine tailored livery was waiting. Mr. Tyler, I presume, Stephen asked upon stopping in front of the door. I am Lord Richmond's son, the Earl of Darnley. He sent me to see to the welfare of the Dowager Duchess. I'm sorry I could not send word, but unfortunately, I felt the need to set out at once. The butler looked him over carefully, almost suspiciously. I sent many letters, he said after a pause. I had expected someone much sooner. Stephen winced. It was a fair rebuke. He had set out shortly after hearing the news for the first time, but from the butler's perspective, he had hardly arrived at once. It had been three weeks since the first plea for assistance. I am sorry for any delay, he said rather lamely. My man is there, Mr. Smith. Could one of your servants show him to my chambers and then lay a room up for him in the servants' hall? The butler nodded, his lips still pursed disapprovingly together, then stepped aside into the house so Stephen could enter. The interior was even more fine than the stone exterior. The floor of the entryway was marble, a continuation of the steps outside, and the high ceilings were painted in an intricate fashion with scenes from various Greek tragedies. The marble entryway gave way to the fine wooden floor of the drawing room, planed beautifully and covered in lush rugs. This room had better light, but still sported the heavy murals of Greek inspiration and furniture gilt with gold. It all felt rather heavy and decadent. The butler paused here, turning to face Stephen. He seemed to have a gentler countenance. It is kind of you to come, he said. I am quite at my wit's end as to how to help her. She clearly needs a doctor, but will brook none to step through the front door. She needs supervision too, but I have other duties about the house and cannot be always on hand. I am not certain how helpful I will be, Stephen said, feeling the first stab of uncertainty. I have never met her after all. I fear we have no shared history upon which to draw. You are family, and that means something to her. Mr. Tyler said quietly, and it is not as though you will do worse than anyone else in the house. She won't listen to a soul. She goes about dressing as she wishes and doing what she wishes, and she has fits of confusion that quite undo the household staff. Before you meet your aunt, I think it best if you speak with some of our servants first, so as to have a fuller picture of the matter. Does that meet with your approval? It does, Stephen said slowly, growing more intrigued by the minute. It does, Stephen said slowly, growing more intrigued by the minute. Uh, the butler then led him through the servant's door in the great wooden wall of the drawing room, taking him down a narrow flight of stairs to the kitchen below. The upstairs had been quiet and almost morose, but down here Stephen felt his spirits lift at the bustle of light and activity. Here was evidence of the force that had kept March Manor from falling into disrepair. Here were the smells of garlic and roasting meat, the sound of servants calling instructions to one another, and the sight of a chambermaid scurrying down the hall with a basket of firewood. Stephen took a deep breath, following Mr. Tyler into the main dining room for the servants. There was a long plank table upon which had been laid a simple tea, and various servants gathered around in conversation. A few of them were mending, some were pressing and one man at the front was packing a pipe. They all dropped what they were doing upon seeing Stephen, and stood with a great scraping of chairs, all conversation ceasing. I would like to introduce to you Lord Darnley, the butler intoned. He will be staying with us for some time, helping in the care of Lady Cecilia at this difficult time in her life. I appreciate the discretion you have all shown in this matter, keeping her situation to yourself. But before Lord Darnley meets her, I think it would be good for him to have some idea of who she is and what he might. He paused a moment and finished rather quietly. Expect. Nobody moved. 
it seemed the servants were uncertain what precisely was expected of them. Mr. Tyler cleared his throat and turned to a plump little maid standing beside him. Miss Stewart, perhaps you could begin. Tell Lord Darnley what happened last week. The girl looked positively frightened, and when she began to speak her words came out slow and shaky. My lord, I don't wish any disrespect. Stephen nodded kindly. Please speak, he said. You will not be held accountable for your honesty. She took a shuddering breath. I lay the fires for Lady Cecilia and tend to the tidiness of her chambers. I came in three days past and found her scribbling on the walls with a quill. There wasn't any ink in it, my lord, but she kept scribbling and scribbling, saying she was writing a beautiful letter to her. The girl paused, blushing deeply. To her lover, my lord. Ah, Stephen frowned. So you are concerned about madness? Concerned about madness? chimed in a lad in footman's livery in the corner. My lord, she doesn't dress properly, and she scares off her few remaining guests with little tricks and illusions. She pretends she is a ghost. I'm not sure she's pretending, another man chimed in. I think she believes she is a ghost. Stephen felt a sudden urge to smile. He restrained this, wanting to appear professional. What sort of tricks? he asked. The nervous maid spoke again, her voice stronger now. The constable came to investigate a theft of sheep that had occurred with one of the manor flocks. She let him wait in the hall for an hour, wouldn't see him or allow us to show him into the drawing room. When the clock struck ten, she came down the great staircase, dressed in only a plain shift as she often wears these days, and shrieked at him in a chilling cry. What did she say? Stephen asked. She said, I know it was you that did it. The girl looked quite frightened herself and then added, The poor man didn't know what to make of it. He told her he wanted to ask her some questions about the missing sheep. She shrieked again that she knew it was him who had done it, and then added, You stole those sheep, and tonight you shall find their wool in your bed. Stephen raised his eyebrows. Eerie. Mr. Tyler took a long, strained breath. That wasn't all. The constable left and as he walked down the great stone steps, she ran back upstairs in her bare feet and, taking a basket of wool she'd torn out of her comforter, dumped it down upon his head like thick snow. He shook his head. We are fortunate that he is a discreet man, but even so it was badly done. He kept the matter to himself, but other tricks have been less secret. There are busybodies in the village that are only too happy to spread whatever tales they can about Our Lady. You believe she is not right in the mind, Stephen ran his fingers along his bearded chin. It certainly seems strange. What have I gotten myself into? He was embarrassed to remember how he'd spent time imagining his aunt's sickness on the carriage ride to the manor. I thought she was going to be some poor woman, confined to her bed and wasting away, that I could read to and help with the management of the home, he thought wryly. This is another business entirely. I think you have a picture, Mr. Tyler said, interrupting his reverie. Are you quite prepared to go upstairs and meet her in person? I am not sure any person could be prepared after what you have shared, Stephen said slowly. But I greatly appreciate your honesty. Perhaps I can help after all. They walked up, through the drawing room, and down a narrow hall to a room the butler called her personal sitting room. This place was quite small and decorated very differently from the rest of the house. There were a few books and a great many windows, a small fireplace, and a single painting of a peaceful landscape against a pale blue wall. Sitting in a chair by the window, her legs curled underneath her, sat his aunt. Stephen would have been able to recognise her even if he didn't know all the stories about her, nor have the butler at his side to make introductions. She looked very like his mother, only older. She had the same freckles that dotted his own face, and though her hair was now snowy white and loose to her shoulders, he could see it fell just as his mother's did about her face. She was wearing a gown that looked as though it had been a dressing gown years ago. It was an elegant brocade, but there was no waist anywhere in the garment. 
Instead, it was loose and baggy, slipping off her frail shoulders. Her feet were bare, he could see them poking out from beneath the folds of her dress. She held a book in her hand, but she was not reading it. Her face was instead studying her free hand, as though she was seeing it for the first time. She looked up suddenly when Mr. Tyler cleared his throat and seemed startled. Who are you? she asked, drawing away into the chair. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Like this video and hit the subscribe button because it helps very much with YouTube's algorithm. Thank you again. Now back to our story. What are you doing in my home? Before Stephen could answer, the butler stepped forward with an impressive show of ritual and tradition. Lady Cecilia, he said in a deep voice, allow me to introduce Lord Darnley. He has come to stay with you for a time. I am putting him up in the east wing of the manor. He has his own man and will not have any demands on your time. I know you, she said, her eyes on Stephen. She stood from the chair, stepping towards him in an eerie, wraith-like manner. She seemed not quite steady on her feet. I have seen your face before. We have never met, Stephen said quietly, but you might remember my mother. Yes, she said. That's it. You have Matilda's eyes. She began to circle him, walking around him very slowly as they talked. It was most disorienting and Stephen felt off balance. What precisely is required of a gentleman in a position such as this? It was all very unconventional. I hope my visit is not unwelcome, aunt, he said gently. All visits are unwelcome, she snapped. Still, he thought he saw a look of interest in her eyes. But before I send you packing, Perhaps you can tell me why you've come. Stephen drew himself up slightly. My parents received your letter, he said. He fibbed slightly, wanting to protect her feelings. They sent me in their stead, he said. I have come to help in your convalescence and to find a doctor who can adequately care for you. I want... His words, however, seemed to be having a truly dreadful effect on his aunt. Her face, already quite pale, grew even more drawn. In the apple of her thin cheeks, a bright red appeared and her eyes flashed. Who told you I was in need of care? she snapped. Then, as if answering her own question, her eyes flew to Mr. Tyler. You, she turned towards him menacingly. You. Before Stephen knew what was happening, the frail little woman in front of him drew back her arm and let loose her book in the direction of the butler. It was a good throw, surprisingly direct for someone who looked as though they might be knocked over by the slightest breeze. But the butler had more experience than Stephen and had apparently seen such an action coming. He ducked, mumbled something about his sincerest apologies, and disappeared through the door. Aunt Cecilia ran to where the book had fallen and, picking it up again, shrieked at the door. You'll not hide from me, old man. Who are you to go around sharing my business with those heartless people? Did you get a good laugh from it? She whirled to Stephen, her eyes wild. Did you laugh, young man? No, he said quickly, his heart beating rapidly. I don't know what to do. That one useless thought was running on repeat in his mind. I didn't laugh, he said lamely. She paused, breathing heavily, and then sank down into a little puddle of brocade on the floor, sitting on the rug and fiddling wearily with the book. I'm so tired, she said weakly. You shouldn't have come. I didn't need anyone to come. Stephen came over to sit beside her, lowering himself carefully onto the floor. He saw his mistake now. It was the worst possible way to begin the conversation, referencing her illness. He tried again. I needed to get away from home, he said surprising himself with his own honesty. I got the letter, and I thought it would be a chance to escape for a time. Will you let me stay? She looked down at her hands. You came because of Tyler, the old rat, she mumbled. He ignored that. You have fine gardens here, he said, looking out of her window. Perhaps when your energy is back, you can walk with me there. I'm too tired for the gardens, she said simply. 
That is why we ought to get a doctor here, Stephen urged her. He could see what is bothering you. He could help you feel better. No doctor. She shook her head violently and began struggling to rise. Stephen helped her to her feet. No doctor, she repeated again. Never a doctor. She seemed to be growing agitated again. All right, Stephen said quickly, knowing it would be futile to fight the battle at present. I won't force you to go to a doctor. She leaned in close as though she was planning on telling him a secret. He froze, listening. After what felt like an eternally long pause, his aunt said quietly, You can't force me, even if you wanted to. Then she sat back, her face bizarrely peaceful, not a shred of the insanity he'd seen previously. I remember your name, she said. You're Stephen, aren't you? He nodded, dumbstruck. Tell me if your rooms are to your satisfaction, Stephen, she said, walking toward the door with all the dignity and composure of a woman in a full ball gown. I'm afraid I must retire at present. Then she whirled around and was gone, the door still open behind her. Stephen stood quite still for a moment and then sat down heavily in a nearby armchair. What just happened? She was like some sort of natural disaster, flying unpredictably around and causing havoc wherever she went. This will not be as easy as I thought, he thought dryly. He was suddenly guiltily glad that his parents weren't here to see this first introduction. They would laugh at me, or at the very least tell me that they were right all along. Mr. Tyler appeared at the door again, peering around the frame as though making certain Lady Cecilia was not lingering inside. She's gone, Stephen said wearily. You were right about the state of things. I'm surprised you waited as long as you did to ask for help. I knew she would not want help, the butler said quietly. I felt loyal to her. I had to wait until it was more disloyal to leave her alone. You did right to ask for our aid, Stephen stood up, blowing out his breath and trying to think. I think we need more help than myself alone, however. She needs something more steady. A lady's companion, perhaps, who can watch her changing whims and help predict her responses to things. Do you think you could put an advert in the newspaper to that effect? The butler nodded, mild surprise on his face. I should have thought of it myself. He paused a moment, looking uncomfortable. Perhaps I should have thought of it before contacting her family. No, you were right to contact me, Stephen reassured him. Lady's companion or not, I think it correct that I'm here to see her condition and try to help her. The two men spoke briefly about what the next day would hold, and then the butler left to place the advertisement, and Stephen wearily retired to his own bedchambers. Chapter 3 Ruth Selwyn sat on the edge of her bed in the servant quarters of Thruce Cross Manor, her heart beating dully in her chest. She'd known this day was coming for some time now, and yet she found herself wondering ridiculous things in these final moments. If I stay here and don't appear above stairs, maybe nothing will change. Maybe life will just march on happily and simply. It was a preposterous thought, and while Ruth had a natural mind towards dreaming, she'd learned the hard way that fanciful thought had no place in the real world. Here, practical actions were what mattered. She'd been employed as a governess at Thruce Cross Manor for three years now, caring for the youngest daughter at the manor, a plump little lass named Lisa who had grown up under Ruth's tutelage to be passably prepared for finishing school. That was the difficulty, in fact. Ruth had finished the last round of studies with Lisa a full week ago now and knew it would only be a matter of time before her employers called her up to dismiss her. No one needed a governess in finishing school. She looked across the room at her reflection in the toilet. The distorted image she could see showed a small, slim girl with wide blue eyes and thick gold hair that she kept pinned back as sternly as she could manage to maintain an older, wiser appearance. She was dressed in a white muslin daydress, over which she wore a stiff brown shift buttoned at the bodice. It was a plain and dull thing to wear, but Ruth had learned early that governesses were expected to be plain and dull. She had almost been denied the position at Thruce Cross Manor when the master and mistress had seen her pretty features. In the end, though, 
they'd surmised that her wit and learning were sufficient and had installed her on the premises. She'd enjoyed the work, more than she'd expected, actually. Initially, she'd only entered the profession to avoid poverty and to escape the sad tragedy that had left her virtually penniless. But days with Lisa had been pleasant and rewarding. Ruth had enjoyed watching the little girl blossom into a tentative young woman. I have been treated well here, she thought honestly. And I'm fearful if I find another place. I will not be so fortunate. She had heard tales, even before she initially agreed to work at Thruce Cross, that governesses were treated badly. She'd heard that they didn't fit in below stairs with the servants, and they had no real role with the family upstairs. In truth, it was a lonely life, but not so dreadful as Ruth had expected. Lisa's parents, Lord and Lady Engleton, were good people, and though they kept her out of sight more often than not, they were fair and kind and paid her wages on time. Ruth stood, let out a little sigh and walked upstairs, passing the kitchen and servants' drawing room before taking the narrow steps upstairs to the Thruce Cross breakfasting room. The servants were already clearing the morning meal away, and Ruth passed quietly on through to the reading room beyond. Lisa was sitting quite properly, her embroidery on her lap. There had been many tears over that embroidery, Ruth remembered fondly. Lisa had hated the dull task at first, and it was only with Ruth's continued efforts that she had been made at last to find some pleasure in the tedious task. Hello, Miss Selwyn, Lisa chirped, looking up only briefly. Then she added, Oh, Mama asked you to go into her sitting room when you're able. So, there it is. Ruth turned, walking towards the sitting room with all the gravity of a martyr approaching the stake. She couldn't help smiling a little at herself, trying to cheer her heart by teasing. Come now, Ruth. It can't be as bad as all that. I imagine Joan of Arc would have been most grateful to switch places with you and watch her career go up in flames rather than her person. Lady Engleton was standing when Ruth entered and turned with a warm smile. There you are, Miss Selwyn. I was looking for you earlier. Do you have a moment to talk? She waved to a chair near at hand, and after Ruth had taken it, sat on the settee. I've been meaning to speak with you all week, but had some business to attend to first. You know that our dear Lisa is quite prepared for finishing school after your dedicated efforts. She paused and cast a benevolent smile in Ruth's direction. Ruth's mouth felt dry. Lady Engleton went on. And I am convinced that only a year or two of finishing school will be sufficient to prepare her for her very first season. Unfortunately, this now leaves us with no need for a governess. Yes, my lady. Ruth said quietly. We will have to let you go, though we will of course pay your wages through the end of the month as formally agreed. Lady Engleton beamed cheerfully. Ruth tried to keep an accepting smile on her face, but in her heart she felt a stab of resentment. It is no great thing to her to send me away, she thought. She will continue in luxury, and it is I who will have to scramble to find food and board and a proper position in society. She had no sooner had this thought, however, when Lady Engleton leaned forward and said kindly, My dear, I can see there is deep concern in your face over this matter. You cannot think I would send you out into the world without a reference or prospects of a future position, can you? Ruth blinked, astonished. I imagined a reference, she began weakly. But what do you mean about prospects? I believe I found another position for you. Lady Engleton went on cheerfully, although I would, of course, never think of committing you without making certain you were agreeable to it. I sent in a reference and have already heard back with an inquiry that expresses some interest in your employment. It seems the case is rather time-sensitive. Oh? Ruth felt her heart warm instantly. I should not have thought the worst of her, she chided herself. She has thought so carefully of my welfare. What is the situation? I know it is a divergence from your proper role as governess, Lady Ingleton said carefully, but I believe it will be a promotion of sorts. You see, there is a woman at March Manor who is looking for a lady's companion. A lady's companion was a very prestigious position for a governess to suddenly leap into, and this gave Ruth pause. I am not trained as a lady's companion, she said slowly. 
I have only ever had this position, and I have no connections aside from you. Ordinarily that would be a mark against you. I cannot deny it, Lady Engleton agreed. But this inquiry makes it clear that the position must be filled at once, and your qualifications seem to have satisfied everyone involved. I know that nothing is certain, but I am assured of the legitimacy of the position through their venerable butler, Mr. Tyler. He is well acquainted with my own butler, and I hear only the best of the staff under his employment. I think you might be happy there. Who is the lady in question? Ruth asked. Lady Cecilia. She is an older woman, and I know very little about her, but you have a gentle temperament, and I suspect could befriend anyone you set your mind to know. Lady Engleton reached forward and gently, uncharacteristically, tapped Ruth's hand. I know you are frightened of your future, dear, she said, but here a most providential opportunity has all but fallen in your lap. I will send a recommendation with you and allow you to take our carriage for the journey. Arriving in style will surely elevate you in the house's estimation. Ruth smiled, a feeling of relief coming over her. She knew that nothing was certain, but everything seemed to indicate that this position would be an elevation from even her current pleasant situation. She could go in with a good reference and a willingness to learn, and she believed wholeheartedly that some good might come from the situation. To be a lady's companion, without ever having trained as one at such a young age, it was a good stroke of fortune to be sure. She turned to her employer with heartfelt thanks. You are kind to me, she said simply. I know it is not usual for employers to be so thoughtful regarding the future of their staff once employment has been severed, and I want to thank you for thinking of me. You proved yourself worthy with our dear Lisa, Lady Engleton said kindly. You brought her up quite nicely when we had all but consigned her to the role of wallflower. I fully expect your friendship and direction is what will ensure a fine season for her in a year or so of time. It is the least we can do to ensure that your future is full of happiness, as I'm sure hers will be. Ruth stood, giving a little curtsy. With your permission, she said, I ought to go pack. Lady Engleton smiled. I'll have the carriage pulled round before midday. Chapter 4 The ride to March Manor was not as long as Ruth had expected but still long enough for her imagination to get a little feisty before she arrived. In her imaginings, the lady of the manor would be a tall and imposing character, attired in silk and fine jewels, who ordered her about imperiously and made unnecessary requests. Or, as her mind turned another way, she imagined a middle-aged woman with a mysterious past, cloaked all in black and veiled. These little flights of fancy made her smile, and at times shiver, but Ruth knew better than to give them any legitimacy. I'll know soon enough, she kept telling herself. At last, at the end of a long row of trees, the carriage pulled up in front of a tall, imposing house with towering windows and an impressive oaken door. Ruth got out timidly, directing the coachman to unload her leather clothes chest and handbag, then paused a moment to collect herself before allowing the carriage to leave and climbing slowly to the great door. She knocked twice before there was an answer. The butler had a thin, drawn face. He looked her up and down with apparent confusion and said nothing, so Ruth introduced herself awkwardly. I am Miss Selwyn, she said. I am answering your advertisement for a lady's companion. She presented the letter from Lady Ingleton. I have my reference. The butler's face lightened with understanding, but his brows were still drawn together rather suspiciously. I received word about you, but we had not expected your arrival so soon. He looked behind her at her belongings on the lane. I see you are rather sure of your employment. I was given to understand the situation was fairly certain, Ruth said, feeling suddenly foolish. I can send for another coach if things are not as I suspected. The butler pursed his lips together and moved aside, motioning to a liveried boy standing just inside. Fetch her bags to the servants' quarters and find her a place there, he said curtly. Then to Ruth. I will have to introduce you to Lord Darnley, and to her ladyship as well. Nothing is certain, 
but you may stay the night regardless of their verdict. He hesitated a moment in the hall, looking around as though to be sure of their solitude before saying quietly, I am not sure this is the right position for you, Miss Selwyn. You seem a pleasant enough lass, but the Dowager Duchess has already disposed of three prospective lady companions, and you seem a slight little thing. Ruth drew herself up to her full height, which was admittedly diminutive, and tried to sound very confident. I'm a good worker, she said, and I learn quickly. I hope Lady Cecilia will not have reason to dismiss me. Oh, you mistake me. The butler sounded cynical indeed. Lady Cecilia did not dismiss the three previous applicants. They left of their own accord. Ruth didn't know what to say. Perhaps I raised my hopes too soon, she thought with disappointment. This does not seem an easy task after all. Before she could gather her wits, however, she heard a voice from behind her on the stairs, pleasant, even jovial. If Lady Cecilia is going to be scaring away all our applicants, Mr Tyler, there is no need for you to be doing so as well. Ruth turned and looked at the speaker. The first thing she noticed about the young man were his eyes, piercing and dark and pointed directly at her. He had bright red hair, most unusual, and a short beard. He looked strong and purposeful, and when she turned around to meet him, he walked to her immediately. He gave a quick bow, to which she responded with a rather foolish curtsy. Miss Selwyn, I presume. He held up a letter and flashed a devastating smile. Fancy that. I was only just at my desk looking over notes and saw Lady Ingleton's notice of your possible arrival. I confess a governess is not what we had expected. Speak. Ruth felt a blush warming on her face. I expect to learn a good deal in this position, she said, a little too softly. But I feel more than ready for the task. You look a little less than ready, he said, a smile in his eyes. But as our dear butler here has already told you, we are not in a position to be choosers at present. We are the proverbial beggars, seeking good help that will endure my aunt's rather eccentric company. Tell me about your aunt she said, finding her voice at last. She wanted to appear professional and capable, not nervous and simpering. What is so eccentric about her behaviour? She is... difficult. He looked at her for a moment in silence, as though trying to decide what to reveal. You will understand more when you meet her. She is unwell, but refuses to see a doctor. Beyond that, she has some behaviours that are unusual for a lady of her standing in society. Such as? she asked. I would rather you see for yourself and determine whether the situation is a tenable one, he said, dodging. I wouldn't wish to reveal too much if you think the matter is beyond your abilities. She felt very small looking up at him and saw her youth reflected in his eyes. He thinks I am too young, she thought, or at least too inexperienced. Then there is no use continuing our conversation here, she said firmly. Please take me to Lady Cecilia. Her command seemed to surprise Lord Darnley. He raised his eyebrows, but this time did not smile. Instead, he nodded to the butler and then motioned with his hand for Ruth to follow him back up the stairs. She is in her own chambers this afternoon, he said, speaking without turning around. And she's not been having a very good day. That is certainly ominous, she thought wryly. I wonder if he knows how much of an Anne Radcliffe he seems when he speaks that way. The thought made her smile inwardly and cheered her enough to chase away the trepidation that she would otherwise have been feeling. At a pair of double doors the man stopped, knocked once, and upon hearing nothing seemed to determine the way clear for entry. He led Ruth inside and stopped just past the threshold. Just a few feet away there stood a woman in a white shift, barefoot, with a bundle of ribbons twisted into a parody of a crown atop her loose white hair. She turned and looked at Ruth with evident surprise and alarm, but said nothing. So, she is mad. The thought frightened Ruth at first, but in the next moment she felt a grain of courage come to her. There was something in the woman's eyes that was familiar to her. Something like the eyes of a child. 
Good day, my lady, she said, stepping forward. I'm Miss Ruth S. The old woman held up her finger and Ruth stopped speaking in response. No, she clucked her tongue. Not my lady. She walked over and began circling Ruth, chanting in a low tone. She raised her arms up and down, moving as though she was some sort of druid priest, the ribbons about her head drifting into her eyes as she danced. Ruth didn't look at Lord Darnley, but she could feel him stiffen at her side. Ruth took a breath and stepped a little away from her companion so Lady Cecilia could circle her uninhibited. Then, after a moment, she asked as brightly as she could, Pardon me, but what are you doing? The woman froze and leaned in, her eyes unnaturally bright. I'm turning you into a witch, my dear, she said. The moon is right for the ritual. She began again, but this time Ruth felt a surge of confidence. She smiled, even laughed a little, and began to turn slowly in the opposite direction of Lady Cecilia's circling. She raised her arms above her head and closed her eyes. Lady Cecilia stopped chanting at once. Ruth opened her eyes. The woman was looking at her strangely. Pardon me, she said, mimicking Ruth's earlier question. But what are you doing? I'm helping, Ruth said simply. I've heard that the fairies will help in a witch transformation if the subject will turn in an opposite direction. I only wanted to keep you from exerting too much effort on my behalf. The Dowager Duchess stepped back a moment, peering at Ruth as though seeing her for the first time. She said nothing but appeared astonished. Perhaps no one has gone along with her antics before, Ruth thought. It was the only explanation for her shocked response. Still, for Ruth, the entire interaction had come quite naturally. The Duchess, in all her madness and strangeness, had merely been behaving like a child, and the one thing Ruth understood was how to handle children. The Duchess turned and sat down on a nearby settee, almost immediately defeated. Ruth sat down carefully beside her. She could feel Lord Darnley's eyes on her and knew he was judging her response, but she pushed the thought from her mind. He hasn't known what to do until now, she thought, so I can't look to him for support. I must try to think about what will be best on my own. My lady, she began carefully. Do you think you might like me to call for some tea? I don't want to rush your process, but I always get thirsty when I'm in the middle of a witching. The woman frowned up at her, eyes hard again. Do not call me my lady, she snapped. I am duchess to you, girl. Ruth fought the urge to comply, instead seeing the request as a sort of vulnerability, an open door for further bargaining. I will comply with your request, she answered slowly but not until you do something for me. The Duchess pulled her eyebrows together, clearly confused and angry. It is not for you to ask anything of me, she said. It is for you to obey. It went against all Ruth's training as a servant, but she held her ground. Yes, she said, and I'm truly delighted to obey in time, but only when you've done what I ask in return. What is it you ask? The Duchess asked, intrigued despite herself. If you hire me as your lady's maid and companion, she said simply, I will be staying with you day and night. The Duchess frowned. And then you will call me Duchess? Ruth smiled. No, that is merely the circumstance necessary for my official request, my lady. I will call you Duchess when you have agreed to see a doctor. The old woman pulled away from her at once, her face icy. No, she said harshly, not a doctor. Never a doctor. Ruth pretended to be disinterested. Quite right, my lady. I completely support your anonymity in this particular area, my lady. Don't call me that! She rose and walked to the other side of the room, grabbing an empty quill off the stand and scratching vainly at the walls. No doctor. Lady Cecilia, Ruth said kindly, please do not mistake me. I would never force you to see a doctor. Not when I can see the idea clearly upsets you. I am only holding firm on my terms. I am Duchess to you, the woman said imperiously. You are, Ruth said with a significant pause. 
when you have agreed to treat yourself with the kindness and care that a duchess deserves, when you have agreed to be seen by a physician. The woman paused, the quill hovering a moment over the wall, then it dropped to her side. A quick doctor? she asked, her voice pleading. Ruth relented at once. A very quick doctor, she said with a smile, coming to put her hand on the old woman's frail shoulders. The quickest. Suddenly, the woman turned and grasped her hands. Ruth felt the woman's fingers were desperati, like a child clinging to its mother. Will you be there, with the doctor? she asked quietly. Of course, Ruth said matter-of-factly. If it had been proper, she would have gathered the little woman into her arms and embraced her, letting her know that there was nothing to fear. I will be wherever you are now, because I am your lady's maid and I am your new companion. You shall have nothing difficult to face without me. Ruth was touched that in such a short time she had built any sort of trust, especially considering how firm and mildly antagonistic she had been with the little lady. Still, it seemed the woman had some manner of faith in her, and that was all Ruth needed to build a relationship of respect and learning. She led Lady Cecilia back to her chair and settled her in with a blanket. Then she walked over to the door and, promising to return soon with a cup of tea and a biscuit, led Lord Darnley out into the hall beyond. Stephen could hardly believe what he'd just seen. He doubted the credentials of Miss Ruth Selwyn when he first read her referral in his office, and those doubts had been confirmed when he saw her slight figure in the lower hall. She was small and fragile, her eyes large and vulnerable. She didn't seem strong enough to withstand the antics Aunt Cecilia was certain to send her way. All these preconceptions, however, had been summarily dissolved when he watched her first interaction with his aunt. He had hardly known what to do with the matter of the chanting and the witch ceremony. But Miss Selwyn seemed to handle it easily enough. She even seemed to enjoy it although Stephen was unsure how that could be. Then there had been the matter of the titles, and Stephen had been forced to swallow his astonishment at her forthright manner, wondering all the while if he ought to step in and remind her of her inferior rank, until her tactic proved worthwhile, and his aunt had agreed at last to see a doctor. When they stepped outside and the door was firmly closed behind them at last, he turned to Miss Selwyn in genuine gratefulness. I do not know how you did it, he said quietly, but your methods speak for themselves. I am impressed by the way in which you conducted yourself, Miss Selwyn, and I would like to hire you at once. She smiled, true delight reflected on her face. This too astonished Stephen. Everyone else acted as though my aunt was a burden, he thought, but she seems to genuinely enjoy her. She gave a quick curtsy. I am delighted to be considered for the position, she said. Then a moment later, and I look forward to a frank discussion of wages and the terms of my continuance. Stephen paused a moment, tempted most heartily to laugh. He had misjudged her yet again based upon her whimsical appearance, and it seemed almost preposterous to hear such a fair creature demanding a frank discussion on business matters. She seemed like the sort who would never breathe a word of income in proper society. Of course, he said, holding back a smile. I was under the impression that a governess of your standing is well used to twenty pounds a year. Are you agreeable to such an income, plus an additional allowance and your room and board? He could see at once that, though she had exhibited great courage in bringing up the subject in the first place, Miss Selwyn was not overly used to discussions of business and bargaining. Her face gave away at once that she thought the wages more than sufficient, for she gave a little start and, blinking quickly, nodded. I suppose, she said, drawing herself up, that would be agreeable for the time being. Perhaps if my work is pleasing, we may reevaluate my wages in six months' time to determine whether or not you deem me worthy of more. Clever girl, he thought. She's perfectly happy with the wage, but is keeping the way open for future earnings. To her face, he merely nodded and said, I think that may be arranged. He turned and led her back downstairs, running into Mr. Tyler in the entryway and pausing a moment. 
Miss Selwyn has been hired, he said. Her work with Lady Cecilia proves most satisfactory, and I'm looking forward to her future employment in our place of residence. He saw a look of discomfort cross the butler's face and guessed its meaning. He thinks the position will crush our little Miss Selwyn, he thought. But he has not seen her in action as I have. He will grow confident with time. I know you have sent her things to the servants' quarters, he said. But there is a room beside my aunt's that is at present unoccupied. I would prefer she be installed there, considering the rather unusual circumstances under which she has been hired. I believe proximity will be of the utmost importance. He saw a look of surprise cross Ruth's face. I am quite happy with the servants' quarters, she said, looking nervously at the butler. You will be a companion as much as a maid, he assured her. It will require your attendance at meals and events to better keep her in check. And therefore I think it only proper that your rooms be above stairs. It will avoid confusion with the other staff. Tyler, for his part, nodded in agreement. I see the wisdom in this plan, he agreed. I will have the room opened up and her trunk sent up at once. Stephen turned to Miss Selwyn and reached out his hand, affording her the proper arrangement of gentlemen entering into business. After a moment's hesitation, she took his hand ever so briefly. To our coming partnership, he said. She bowed her head, a little blush appearing in her cheeks and pulled her hand back as quickly as she'd given it. He instantly regretted the gesture. He'd meant it as a sign of respect, but saw that she was made uncomfortable by the familiarity of the motion. I shall be more careful in the future, he vowed. He drew away a step and gave a quick bow. She responded in kind, and they went their separate directions to prepare for what was sure to be a most tumultuous time ahead. Chapter 5 The next morning Stephen awoke to Smith's knock on his door and climbed out of bed with anticipation. His valet drew open the blinds and laid out his trousers and riding coat for the day. Are you still planning a trip into town, my lord? he asked. I drew up your coat for that purpose, but was unsure if your plans had changed. You are correct, Stephen assured him, stepping into his clothes with care. My mission today is to find the town doctor and convince him to see to the well-being of my aunt. She agreed to as much yesterday with Miss Selwyn, but I have no certainty that her mood will remain favourable. Miss Selwyn appeared below stairs last night, Smith said, helping to fasten the cuffs on Stephen's coat. She seemed a pleasant enough lass. I believe there was some mild surprise among the servants that she had deigned to introduce herself in the servants' quarters, but for the most part the verdict was that she seemed quite sweet and unassuming. A bit too sweet if she is to hold my aunt in check, Stephen said, then shrugging. But so far she has proved more able than I. I cannot complain. A letter came in the post yesterday, Smith said, pulling it out and laying it on the table. I would have brought it to you sooner, but it was held up with some documents in the library. I told them you had not set up an office there, but the servants below stairs seem to think all your correspondence must be shuffled there regardless. Stephen picked it up and broke the seal, reading the contents quickly. It is from my parents, he said, disheartened as he read. They wish to know why I have not yet returned home. They speak of the coming season and the opportunities I am currently missing. He closed the paper and tossed it aside, fiddling disconsolately with his cravat. We have been here for a few weeks now, my lord, Smith said carefully. And we will be here for a few more, Stephen responded quickly. At present to leave my aunt would be most ungentlemanly. I see that she needs aid, and if I were to ride to London so as to avoid missing the first ball of the season, I would feel sorely the curse of unfinished business. He brushed his hair back from his face and, directing Smith to call for his horse to be brought round after the morning meal, made his way down to the breakfast room. To his surprise, the new Miss Selwyn was already there with his aunt. Previous to her arrival, his breakfasts had always been either alone or interrupted near the end by the arrival of his aunt, in a state of great dishevelment. This morning, though still in a sparse shift, his aunt seemed calmer and more composed. 
It even looked as though she'd allowed her companion to brush her hair and braid it back in a proper French braid, tied with a bit of ribbon at the end. Miss Selwyn was wearing a simple brown morning gown dotted with white flowers. Her soft hair was pulled back in a sober bun and only a few wisps had managed to escape their confines. She looked up with a bright smile upon his arrival and paused momentarily in the buttering of a scone. My lord, she said, good morning to you. And to you, he said, shooting a glance at his aunt. And you, Aunt Cecilia. His aunt looked at him only briefly, but turned her gaze quickly back to the person who seemed to hold her utter fascination, the new lady's companion at her side. Miss Selwyn behaved as though oblivious to the attention, calmly going on to prepare a plate for his aunt and pour her a bit of tea. The crumpets are fine this morning, Miss Selwyn said, but Lady Cecilia has declared them too hard for a morning meal and opted for the softer scones. The food here has always been quite fine, Stephen said, sitting and preparing his own plate. I find I don't even miss the repast of my own home in Cheshire. Miss Selwyn raised her eyebrows with interest. Cheshire? Is it quite lovely there? There are some fine walks, he answered, and the sandstone ridge has an invigorating overlook. I have heard as much, she answered. You must miss your family. Stephen paused a moment, tempted to tell her that he did not, in fact, miss his family or the life that waited for him back home. Such a thing would have been honest, but it would have been too forthright for a conversation with an employee. Instead, he gave a quick nod and forced a smile. It is right and proper to miss one's family, he said non-committally, pouring himself some tea and looking away. A mischievous urchin may soon do my first, if he meets with a teapot or ewer, Aunt Cecilia chirped suddenly, her eyes fixed on Miss Selwyn. After a long, confused pause, at which point Stephen found himself looking at the placid-faced lady's companion in confusion, his aunt continued, My second bring on us both hunger and thirst. My whole thirst and hunger will cure. Stephen set down his fork. It was this sort of madness that had confounded him in the days before Miss Selwyn's arrival. He thought it best to converse with his aunt, but when she interjected strange riddles like this in the place of proper conversation, he hardly knew how to proceed. Miss Selwyn, however, seemed unperturbed. Quite so, she said, smiling at the dowager, although a bit on the nose for our present activity. She went back to her meal, and the time progressed in relative peace, although Stephen was unsure how such a state was maintained. She caught on to the answer to the riddle quickly enough, he thought. And yet I have still not deciphered it. When the meal drew to a close, he pulled her aside as his aunt went ahead to her drawing room. Miss Selwyn, may I have a moment? he asked. Of course, she said, stopping quickly and looking up at him with a bright, disarming smile. How may I help you, my lord? I wanted you to know my plan for the day, he said. I am riding into the village to find the doctor and bring him back to help my aunt. After she agreed to see him last night, I am filled with renewed hope that she will be well in time. A wonderful plan, my lord. Miss Selwyn said. We will take a turn in the gardens later, so if we are not here when you return, you may look for us there. Quite so, he said, pausing a moment and feeling suddenly uncomfortable. Is there anything else, my lord? she asked, looking up at him innocently. No, not at all. He turned to go and was nearly to the front door when she called out after him. The answer to her riddle, my lord, was break and fast. Breakfast. She smiled when he turned around to look at her, and he wondered for a moment if she was teasing him. You, of course, already knew that, she amended quickly, the same laughing look in her eyes. But just in case you didn't know for some strange reason. He nodded, put on his hat and took his leave, laughing to himself as he went. His horse was saddled and ready at the base of the stairs and he found the route into town pleasant and easy riding. The roads here were country roads, but well kept, and not nearly as rutted or rocky as the ones he'd grown up navigating at home. 
When he reached the village at last, he went first to the inn and inquired after the address of the local doctor. We've a new one in town, the innkeeper grumbled, bustling about his work at the bar as he spoke. I can't set store by him myself. Our old doctor was a regular gentleman with proper education in the medicinal arts, but sadly had to take his leave a fortnight back to tend to a family emergency. He is replaced at present by another doctor entirely, who has only been in town a few days. He is rumoured to be quite the world traveller, and though many attest to his superior experience, he has yet to be proved in our little village. What is his name, and where does he reside? Stephen asked. You need only cross the street to the row houses yonder and knock upon the blue door, the man assured him. Dr. Edward Morris he is. He looked suspicious. And the best of luck to you, I can say. As I mentioned, you cannot set serious store by his experience, Stephen finished for him. I will consider myself duly warned. He crossed the street and was surprised to find the door answered on the second knock. Standing before him was an older man with grey hair and sideburns. The man wore the proper black coat of his profession and held in his hand a little watch on a gold chain. He frowned at Stephen. Yes, I'm looking for Dr. Morris. I am he, the doctor stood aside. Would you like to come inside? I can't stay long, Stephen answered, staying on the stoop outside. I only wish to ask if you could make your way out to March Manor later this week. My aunt resides there and is quite unwell. I believe she has a touch of... He paused, unsure of the right word to use. In the end, he settled on the one he knew a man of the medical profession would understand. A touch of madness, he said, adding quickly, and she seems to be ailing in body. She has only just agreed to have a doctor attend her, and I wish to take advantage of this change of heart at once. The doctor paused a moment and then, smiling, turned behind him and took in hand his cane and cloak. Very well. Stephen paused, surprised. Now? Yes, the doctor pushed gently past him and shut the door behind him. You said it was a timely matter, and as you can see, I am in want of patience at present. It is always so in a new town. It takes a bit of desperation and proving before the village folk trust my medicine. Stephen raised his eyebrows, liking the man's honesty already. Let us fetch a horse for you from the town livery, and we can ride back to the manor at once, he said. They set out together, arriving at the manor as the midday sun was high in the sky. They talked little on the journey, just enough for Stephen to learn that the innkeeper had indeed been correct about the doctor being well-travelled. It sounded as though the old man had been to every exotic place where the British held sway and had carried back with him herbal remedies and local knowledge about various maladies. He seemed a quiet man in general, unwilling to boast about his experiences. He only shared a small bit, and only in response to Stephen's repeated questions. At the manor, they walked inside together and into the empty drawing room. My aunt's companion said they might be in the gardens, Stephen said, looking out and catching a glimpse of skirts far away near the hedge. I think I see them there. Come with me. The two walked outside, and Stephen guided the older man to a bench in the shade. Wait here a moment and I will bring her over, he assured the man. I believe she will be more comfortable if she can come to you on her own terms. He proceeded into the hedge maze a few metres away, ducking under the twining arch and into the cool interior. He saw Miss Selwyn first, bending helpfully over his aunt, who was perched on a little stone bench, peering out through the greenery in the direction of the house. Miss Selwyn looked up when she saw Stephen, her face worried. She has seen your friend, she said. She protests most strongly that she will not see a doctor. She declares that she has changed her mind. Stephen sighed. This is precisely what I was afraid of. Then he noticed a change in his aunt's countenance. Her face, almost pressed against the hedge in her effort to spy on the old doctor, softened suddenly. She drew back from the hedge and looked at Stephen, shaking her head. Not today, she said, more calmly than he had expected. Miss Selwyn cast a quick glance at Stephen, then back at his aunt. 
Not today, she repeated hopefully. But another day? He seems an old man, his aunt went on almost wistfully. He is a good doctor, Stephen said. He has travelled much and knows his job very well. We will be with you the entire time, I assure you. He looked at Miss Selwyn, remembering how quickly his aunt had taken to her the night before. Miss Selwyn will be with you. His aunt sat quite still for a moment, unusually silent and calm. Then she shook her head again. Perhaps I can see him later, she said, but at present I do not wish to see the doctor. She looked up, her eyes reflecting the dappled light of the vines overhead. You go speak with him. I am going to watch the leaves dancing. Miss Selwyn looked at Stephen with what he could only guess was apology in her eyes. Perhaps I can come with you to speak to the doctor, she said. Of course, he said more curtly than he'd meant. He knew it wasn't her fault that his aunt's mind had changed in the interim between their conversation last night and today's adventures. However, he felt disappointed nonetheless that the doctor had come all this way for no purpose. He led the lady's companion back out to Dr. Morris and introduced the two. It is no matter, Dr. Morris assured them both. I can come another day when your aunt is feeling better. As you describe her symptoms, though, I would not be so certain to assume she is going mad. He smiled at Miss Selwyn. This lady, in particular, accounts for her actions in a way that gives me much hope. How do you mean? Stephen said, looking at Miss Selwyn as well. She has only told you about her experience over the last few days. And what she's described is not necessarily the markers of madness. I would guess your aunt is suffering from extreme loneliness. It seems she has been shut off for some time, and such isolation can make a person say and do strange things. He stood and brushed off his coat. I imagine your aunt would benefit from your continued attention and friendship. I am loath to prescribe any medicinal remedies until I have seen her, but I would go on to say you have inadvertently stumbled upon the best remedy, companionship. Try this new situation with your Miss Selwyn for a few weeks and come back to tell me how your aunt's illness is proceeding. He left after that, following the butler outside and leaving Stephen with Miss Selwyn in the garden. Stephen turned to her, wanting to apologise for his earlier sharpness of tone but not knowing how. She, however, seemed nonplussed. It is a good thought, she said simply waiting to see if companionship is all she requires. Yes, he said quickly, taking her cue to keep the exchange professional. I am hopeful he is right. They hesitated a moment longer, and then Stephen gave a sharp bow and took his leave. Chapter 6 Ruth waited until the Earl had gone before setting off to find the Duchess. She tried to focus on the matter at hand and ignore how cold Lord Darnley had seemed in their recent conversation. He had clearly been disappointed in her and in his aunt's lack of progress, but Ruth knew that things like this took time and was more hopeful. It doesn't matter what he thinks of me, she tried to tell herself. All that matters is Lady Cecilia and the job I've been sent here to do. Still, she couldn't help thinking about Lord Darnley's chocolate eyes and the disappointment they'd held. She found the Duchess still waiting in the arbour, on the same stone bench, looking out at the scene beyond. Were you listening to our conversation? Ruth asked her. I could not hear you, Lady Cecilia said, turning away from the hedge and crossing her arms. You were too far away. Ruth sat beside her. You would have heard everything quite clearly if you had agreed to meet with the doctor yourself she said gently. Then after a pause she added, Why did you refuse to see him? I thought we had an agreement, you and I. The Duchess started picking at the light muslin cloth of her shift. Her fingers plucked along the fabric as though she were playing a musical instrument, drawing a silent melody out of the plain white folds. She was quiet for so long that Ruth had almost given up on receiving an answer when the Duchess at last spoke. I don't refuse to see him, she said softly. 
After all the frenzy of her behaviour over the past few days, she seemed strangely content. She seemed to know her own mind for the first time since Ruth had met her. I just can't see him now. When the time is right, I will make myself ready for a proper interview. At present, I am quite well in body and spirit and in no need of physic. Ruth heartily disagreed, but pushed her disapproval aside and tried to understand. You complain of feeling ill and you seem at times confused, my lady. Do you not think these things would be remedied by a doctor? Perhaps, the Duchess said simply. She offered no other explanation or argument, just the simple perhaps that hung between them now, quiet and non-committing. Ruth took a deep breath. The doctor himself did not think you were in need of his services, she said, shrugging. In truth, he spoke of you as though you were a victim of nothing more than a spot of loneliness. He said that your actions and your ailments could be explained away without the diagnosis of madness or hysteria. She had only spent the span of twenty-four hours with the old lady, but in that time she had hardly heard the woman speak two sentences at a time, and these were always strange and mad phrases or else antagonistic declarations like the day before. Now, however, Lady Cecilia seemed thoughtful and sad. She folded her worried hands in her lap. If he doesn't think I'm mad, she asked slowly, and if he thinks I am merely lonely, then what does he put forth as the cure? He says that you will likely benefit from companionship, Ruth said simply. The little old woman looked up at those words, and for the first time her face seemed clear and open, as though she was almost happy. What else did he say? she asked. He seems a most learned man to have come to such a conclusion. I think he seemed intelligent, and likely a leader in his field, Ruth assured her. He simply seemed to imply that loneliness could be a harmful thing, and if given the chance we might be able to salvage your happiness with some friendship. I do not wish to be a charity case, the old woman said suddenly. You are not the only one that needs friends, Ruth said quickly. Please know that our shared companionship is a benefit to myself as well as to you. The old woman stared at her for a long time. Ruth felt uncomfortable, as though she was one of the little insects she'd seen pinned on display in the Engleton's library. At long last, Lady Cecilia stood up and cleared her throat. I would like to dress for dinner tonight, she said. Do you think you could assist me in my preparations? Ruth was so astonished that she took a moment to respond. Dress? For dinner? The woman before her looked every bit the part of an invalid, and a mad invalid at that. It seemed wholly unlikely that this brief conversation, and a mere brush with the doctor, had been enough to change Lady Cecilia's outlook so completely. She didn't know for certain, but imagined the old woman before her had not changed for dinner in some time. She gathered herself quickly, not wishing to scare the older woman with her disbelief. Of course I can help you, she said. Come with me. The two walked upstairs, Ruth helping support the other's frail figure. And when they arrived in her chamber, Ruth went to the large oaken wardrobe at the far end of the room and unlatched the dusty doors, revealing a long row of satin and silk gowns ensconced within. Do you know what you wish to wear? she asked. Lady Cecilia didn't hesitate. She walked over and ran her feather-light fingers over the fabrics until she stopped on a deep navy gown and pulled it out. It was lighter than it looked, for she was able to carry the long folds with ease over to the bed. Ruth went back into the wardrobe and reappeared with proper undergarments, a fresh shift and stays. She helped the older woman dress, going through the motions more slowly than usual, as one might tiptoe around a frightened hare. Lady Cecilia, however, showed no signs of bolting or changing her mind. In fact, she shed her fearful demeanour almost completely and merely stood like a statue in the centre of the room. She was only turning on occasion to help Ruth with the dressing, and otherwise looking at her figure in the mirror with all the sophistication and ownership of a fine lady. Ruth buttoned the sleeves around her delicate wrists and laced up the back. She noticed that though Lady Cecilia seemed a good deal frailer than when this dress had originally been made, 
it still was a stunning sight against her pale hair and fair freckles. Ruth finished by pinning up the old lady's hair in a simple fashion with the old French curled lock falling down one side of the woman's head. It was hardly fashionable these days, but something told Ruth that Lady Cecilia was a woman of old times, with a heart stranded somewhere in the past. A ribbon necklace and pearl earrings finished the ensemble, and the old woman smiled at herself in the glass. It will still be an hour before dinner is laid, Ruth said quietly. Why don't you make yourself comfortable by the window, and I will tidy up the room before we go down? You should go change, Lady Cecilia said, peering at her as though seeing her for the first time. You have a plain garb. People will think that you are in trade. I am in a trade, of sorts, Ruth said with a little smile. She was not offended by the older woman's comment, just as she would not have been offended if a child had said such a thing to her. I have nothing else fine to wear. If I were to change for dinner, I would simply be changing from one dull ensemble to another. She laughed and shrugged. But I will say that your wardrobe is impressive. Then slipping it in sideways as if she didn't really care, she added, Perhaps we can work through it day by day. You wear a different gown every evening until I have seen them all. Lady Cecilia smiled and reached her hand up to gently touch her hair. Perhaps I will, she said softly. Chapter 7 Stephen stopped outside the door to the dining room and inspected the card basket on the table. Mr Tyler was close at hand, winding one of the clocks, and looked up at Stephen's pause. Is something the matter, my lord? he asked. Is something the matter, my lord? he asked. Stephen pulled up the letter he'd been looking at, recognising the hand. Did this letter come just today? The butler nodded. But an hour ago with the evening post. Stephen looked at it once more. My parents. Again. He tucked it in his pocket without reading it. Surely it could wait until later that evening. There would be no need to read through another missive detailing all the dances and opportunities he was missing by choosing to stay at March Manor. Still, it irked him that they'd written so soon after the first letter without even giving him the chance to respond. It had a flavour of harassment about it. He walked into the dining room and took a seat, not surprised to see his aunt's and Miss Selwyn's chairs still empty. He was a little early, and they had appeared at dinner for only a moment the night before to snatch away a tray to his aunt's chambers. It was for this reason, then, that he was shocked to look up only moments later and see Miss Selwyn escorting his aunt into the dining chamber. He had never seen his aunt attired in such a manner, in the silk brocade of a fine lady, with her hair up and a tinge of colour in her pale cheeks. She looked almost regal. He stood, his chair scraping a bit in his haste, and went to help escort his aunt to her seat. You look a vision this evening, dear aunt, he said pulling out her chair in lieu of the footman and helping her into her seat. It is truly a delight to see you so well. You fuss too much, Lady Cecilia said, waving her hand as though she always came to dinner so attired. He hid a smile and turned to pull out Ruth's chair for her. She seemed surprised as though it was not often the case that gentlemen went about extending polite courtesies in her direction. Thank you, sir, she mumbled sliding into place quickly as though self-conscious of his aid. When she moved past him, his hand brushed against her waist. She pulled away as though burned, and he pulled his hand back, chagrined that the accident would have made her feel uncomfortable. He was startled by the way he felt, suddenly alert to her nearness. He stepped back as soon as he could and found his seat across the table without meeting her gaze. He had never felt anything like that. A jolt of connection and he disliked the vulnerability it brought out in him. When he looked up at last, he saw Miss Selwyn's eyes on the cold pea soup of their first course, two spots of colour in her cheeks. He felt instantly guilty for having made her uncomfortable and strove to put her at ease again. How did this happen? he asked quietly, so only she could hear, nodding at his aunt's beautiful attire. She looked up, smiling gratefully, and gave a little shrug. With that, a tiny motion, the ice seemed to be broken again, 
and he felt the brief accidental touch had been forgotten. No harm done. And yet, could he really consider the way he'd felt harm? It still lingered in his fingers, the sensation of being so near to her. He felt his breath catch at the memory and chided himself instantly for his ridiculous thoughts. Mr. Tyler came in with a tray of crudités and paused quite abruptly in the doorway. He was looking for all the world like a man about to cry out in astonishment at the sight of Lady Cecilia sitting in a fine dining gown at the head of the table. Thankfully, he was behind Stephen's aunt and had a chance to compose himself before coming around the table to offer up the food. You are looking well this evening, Duchess, he said coolly. It must be all that fresh air you got in the garden this afternoon. All the fresh air in the world couldn't fashion a gown suitable for dinner time, she retorted, looking up at her butler with an air of coy superiority. Are you sure you aren't noticing the fact I'm wearing a proper gown for the first time in years? He blinked, clearly taken aback by her forthright nature, and Stephen saw Miss Selwyn lower her face as though trying to contain a laugh. He himself felt the butler's astonishment terribly amusing but he managed to keep an aloof expression until the dinner had been served out and poor Mr. Tyler made his escape. Dear Aunt, Stephen said, when once the door had closed behind the butler, you are teasing him and you know how very proper he is. I doubt he would ever have admitted your unconventional manner of dressing if you had not brought it up of your own accord. That is precisely why I needed to bring it up, she said, popping a grape into her mouth and smiling sweetly. There is such a great deal that we do not speak of in this house. I think that it is only right for us to occasionally allow new topics to be explored. What else do you not speak of, aunt? Stephen asked. Your servant Smith, for example, she said so quickly that it took Stephen quite aback. He hadn't realised that she knew of his servant, much less anything secretive about him. I do not know what you mean, he said, baffled. He noticed that Miss Selwyn was hiding a smile again. Miss Selwyn, what is this great mystery regarding my servant? Is there something I ought to know? She shook her head gravely. I believe it is for your aunt to tell you, as the whole matter was her manufacture. Aunt? He set his fork down and waited. The old woman smiled at him benevolently. I noticed that your valet was a bit too proper around the edges and rather too imperious with the maid laying the fire this morning. I had a bit of fun with his bags, that's all. Stephen looked at Miss Selwyn. And? The lady's companion laughed then, a light sound like the tinkling of bells, as though unable to hold in her mirth any longer. It was nothing dreadful, she said, just a frog. And in our defence... He'd left his trunk upstairs for one of the other servants to carry down. He seems a nice enough fellow, but just very sure of his station as relates to others in the house. Stephen grinned and shook his head. I cannot disagree with you on that point, although your methods of bringing him down a peg are a bit uncouth. Tell me, which of the servants did you recruit to capture the beast and slip it into his trunks? Why would we need to recruit anyone? Miss Selwyn said innocently, a twinkle in her eyes. It is not a difficult thing to carry a little frog in from the gardens. I'm sure even you could manage it with a bit of practice. You are ribbing me, Miss Selwyn. Is that entirely proper? He asked, teasing her. She merely smiled wordlessly and took a drink of the port wine a footman had just poured for her. Aunt Cecilia followed suit, saying only, if a young man like your Mr. Smith cannot take a little amphibious joke every now and then, then he is not a proper valet. The three laughed again, and the dinner continued on in unusual merriment. At the end of the meal, Stephen's aunt pushed back from the table and fixed her gaze on him with a light in her eyes. I fancy a bit of dancing, she said lightly. Will you humour me? I will, Stephen agreed readily. Miss Selwyn, do you play? She shrugged. Passably well. If you expect only the most plebeian of tunes, I think we can manage well enough together. They retired to the drawing room, where the servants had already started a fine, warm fire 
and lit an abundance of candles to fill the place with warmth and welcome. Miss Selwyn walked over to the pianoforte and pulled back the cover, dusting off the top with a delicate motion of her hand. Stephen found himself looking at her slender wrists, delicate and curved in the candlelight. He looked away quickly. What is wrong with you, Stephen? The lady's companion sat down and began a little ditty. Something Stephen remembered from countless balls and dances before. Something that required a bit of footwork. He was worried at first that it was too upbeat for his aunt to manage, but she took his hand and went through the motions as though she had been dancing every night for years. There was a twirl and a promenade, a skip and a stutter step, and in a matter of minutes the dance drew to a close and his aunt curtsied prettily. Another! she exclaimed, clapping her hands like a little girl. She turned to Miss Selwyn. Something slower this time. Something that hearkens to missed opportunities and love lost. Miss Selwyn hesitated a moment and looked up, seemingly unconsciously towards Stephen. Their eyes met a moment and she looked down again quickly. I have a tune from my childhood, she said. She began to play more slowly, and in a moment Stephen could see that the tune had the lilt and mournful quality of an old Irish melody. He counted out the rhythm and settled on a slower promenading dance, full of dignity and longing. His aunt seemed lost in her own world, moving in perfect sync, but looking off away from him as though imagining another in his place. Miss Selwyn's voice, soft and clear, sang the words as she played. There is a place, far, far away, where lovers go at end of day, to find the ones that love them true, and there to rest, those gentle few. She closed her eyes a moment as she sang, and Stephen stole the brief seconds to look at her as he moved about the parlour with his aunt. This Miss Selwyn was a curious woman. She seemed so simple and even fragile. But when she spoke it was with an authority and gentility that took him aback. More than that, Stephen had been raised with servants all his life, and for the most part had not noticed them with more than a professional interest. Miss Selwyn, however, seemed to draw his attention wherever she was. Here, dancing, he kept waiting for the moment the turn would bring her back into his vision. At the table earlier, her teasing had brightened him in a way he had not felt in some time. It was inexplicable, and yet as she sang the next verses, Stephen found himself hanging on every word. And those that weep for lovers gone can find themselves ere long, there beneath the bending sheaves with the lovers that they grieve. Stephen tore his thoughts away from the slim figure at the pianoforte, confused. Attempting to focus elsewhere, he asked his aunt what she was thinking about. Her eyes, cloudy with some unspoken memory, turned to him. I'm glad you came, his aunt said. It wasn't an answer to his question, but it was bolstering all the same. He smiled back. I am glad I came as well. He shook his head in wonderment. I admit I am having a beautiful time here, perhaps more exciting than I have yet experienced. He paused and winked at her. That is saying much, as I have already toured the continent twice, and one of those times I was in an Italian villa. She frowned at him, amusement in her eyes. If this is more exciting than Italy, dear nephew, then you were not properly experiencing Italy. They loved Chapter 8 The smooth keys of the pianoforte calmed Ruth's nerves as she played. She had never felt like an aficionado in the realm of music, and yet she knew enough to find comfort in the familiarity of song. This particular tune she played reminded her of her parents, bringing back memories of cool autumn evenings around the fire. Toasted bread and cheese, and the soft humming of her mother's voice over her embroidery. She saw Lady Cecilia and Stephen sit in the corner halfway through the dance, pausing from frolicking for a bit of conversation, perhaps, and moved on to another Irish tune about the fairies. This tune was sung in Gaelic, and she did not know the words. Instead, she played without singing, letting her mind drift. She was lost in thought when she felt a gentle touch on her shoulder and looked up in surprise to see Lord Darnley looking down at her. He raised a finger to his lips and motioned toward the couch. 
Lady Cecilia, white and tiny in the folds of her dark navy dress, had fallen asleep on the cushions of the settee. Ruth slowed her playing and stopped, rising carefully from the instrument. We ought to take her upstairs, she said softly. She is too old to sleep on a settee without sore joints in the morning. Lord Darnley nodded. I will find a servant to help. Ruth shook her head and smiled. There is no need to disturb them. They eat their meal after hours and are likely turning in for bed at present. I will help you carry her upstairs. She is a wee thing after all. He looked at her with mild surprise, and it occurred to her that the son of Lord Richmond had likely never considered his servant's meal schedule before. He paused a moment and then nodded. Right then, let us carry her up together. He walked over and picked her up, very gently and quite easily. Ruth found there was no need for her to offer aid. Instead, she gathered up the shawl and shoes that had slipped off the lady of the house. She tiptoed after him, helping to open doors as they went. He seemed at ease with his task and arrived at the door to Lady Cecilia's chambers without a hint of being winded or tired. He carried her in and laid her gently on the bed. We ought not to wake her, Ruth said. She would have to sleep in her grand evening gown. Changing her into night clothes would be the task of another evening. Instead, she pulled a coverlet over the lady and made certain she was comfortably arranged on her pillows. Then she bustled about silently, blowing out the candles and tamping down the fire before slipping outside again and closing the door behind her. Lord Darnley watched all of this in silence. He stepped outside when she did and waited for her in the hall until the door was fastened. Ruth was uncertain how to interpret his nearness. She hoped he trusted her, and yet here he was, seeing that she did everything properly. Good evening, my lord, she said significantly, curtsying before preparing to go to her chambers. It was a good night, wasn't it? he asked, making no move to leave. I thought as much. It was not a very long night, Ruth said, smiling and glancing at the clock. I doubt many people would consider nine o'clock the definition of dancing the night away. It shows that a very little bit of excitement will go a long way with our dear Duchess. We shall have to keep that in mind in the future. You are right that the night is young, he said. Then, as though a thought had occurred to him, he asked, Would you like to come back downstairs to the drawing room for a glass of sherry? She looked at him uncertain. I didn't mean... She paused blushing to think that he had interpreted her statement as a plea for companionship or a request to further the evening. I am quite happy with an early bedtime. It is just a glass of sherry, he said, tilting his head to one side and looking at her in an inscrutable manner. I only wish to share some conversation with an intelligent lady and finish the evening as pleasantly as it was begun. She bit her lip. It is rather bold of you to assume I am both intelligent and a lady. I'm not a blue stocking yet. I'm not so sure about that, he said with a smile. But come downstairs and prove me wrong. Fill my ear with dull and meaningless conversation and I shall never plague you with another evening request. She looked at him a long moment, then let out her breath quietly. He is being kind, she thought. It is nothing more. It was tempting, with a man so bright and handsome, to think more of such charming banter than it was. She looked down at her hands, remembering the tasks she had done as a governess and a lady's maid, noting the lesser quality of her muslin skirt and the plain cut of her shoes. As long as she remembered her station, there could be no real risk in enjoying this gentleman's company for an evening. She smiled up at him. Quite right, she agreed. Let us seek out the sherry. They walked downstairs to the drawing room, and Stephen went to the wine cart, pouring a glass of amber liquid from a crystal decanter. He carried it over and handed it to her, looking over at the pianoforte as he did so. You play well, he said. If you are looking for intellectual conversation, she prodded, then you ought not to start out with an unnecessary overstatement. I play passably. You are too hard on yourself, he said. You are no concert pianist. 
But what we required tonight, and what most peaceful parties require, was a bit of music that was easy to follow and pleasant to listen to. You provided both, and you did so well. She blushed and took a sip of the sherry. It warmed her chest on the way down. She looked around the room. There are quite a few good volumes in here, she said. Better than the library. Yes, I noticed that, he frowned around him. The library is primarily law review books and a few agricultural texts. It is hard to find enjoyment there. Perhaps not enjoyment, she answered, but I could see usefulness in such a library, especially as a landowner. I imagine you have spent some time learning about agriculture so as to better understand the plight of your tenants. He looked at her, that telltale expression of surprise on his face again. I have not spent as much time studying such things as I ought, he said after a moment. Father always emphasised the need for a landlord to be aware of the bigger picture, to make the necessary and difficult changes that people down in the weeds cannot make. I see the wisdom in that, she answered. But I think that a big picture is often made clearer by the details. He raised his eyebrows. You speak your opinions very forcefully. No she said with a smile. I just speak them. They seem forceful because you aren't used to hearing such things from a woman. He laughed then, quite unexpectedly, shattering the aura of intimidation that she had previously felt. Miss Selwyn, he said, I must say that I enjoy your companionship. Before she could answer, he went on. Tell me something about yourself. What is it about your former position as a governess that you most miss? She thought for a moment, and then answered. I could tell you that I most enjoyed watching my pupil flourish from a petty girl into a brave woman willing to learn difficult things. But that is not the truth. Not exactly. She took another sip of sherry and bit her lip. I most miss these little French loaves the cook used to make on Friday afternoons. They were absolutely scrumptious. She paused seeing her companion hiding a laugh. No, you mustn't think me shallow. They really are the most delicious things you've ever eaten. You can't laugh until you've tried one. And that would seem unlikely as I am not planning to be a governess, he said, smiling broadly. And a fortunate thing, she said gravely, for I have heard that bearded governesses are quite looked down upon in the community. He laughed aloud and set down his glass. How did you become a governess in the first place? he asked. She froze, her fingers suddenly clammy against the cut crystal. She thought, as she always did in moments like these, of the last memories she had of her parents. The carriage rolling away, the horses pulling at the traces, the wool of her mother's coat rippling in the wind. No, Lord Darnley might be a charming man, and a kind one as well, but he was still her employer and did not have rights to that story. She forced a smile. It was the one option that was open to me. He looked at her with knowing eyes, but did not press further. She was grateful for the privacy he had afforded her. After a moment he offered up of his own accord, I have always had many options open to me, and yet one rules all in my father's estimation. I am to be the Duke one day and all my life trajectory must point to that end. She smiled, but said nothing. Why do you smile? he asked. Because your woes are so very aristocratic, she thought. I am only listening. No, you think me spoiled, he corrected her. You think it is not such a terrible thing to be forced to be a duke one day. It is only that, when speaking of life trajectories, all you had to do to fulfil yours was... She paused, wondering if she was overstepping, and then plunged ahead. To be born. He raised his eyebrows and sat in silence for a moment. Then he leaned back and looked at her. You might be right, he paused. I am fortunate. I ride through London and see men and women fighting for their very survival. I hear about my tenants going through hard times, and though we do what we can to help those under our care, I know that my golden difficulties would be luxuries to them in their time of trial. Ruth froze, listening with amazement. 
She had never heard a man of nobility speak so frankly, certainly not with so much compassion for the poorer classes. He went on. All I am saying is that there are many types of cages, and mine is simply that the good things in my life are conditional on me, resigning myself to a position and responsibilities that are tied to a title. He looked into the fire. They are good responsibilities, and I think I will be good at executing them. Still, I will always be beholden to that title and that position in society. I am unable to make the choices I wish about work or livelihood or love. This last word he spoke so softly that Ruth almost did not hear it. When she did, she sat quite still. It was not wholly appropriate for him to be speaking to her this way. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the full book. The full audiobook will be available on YouTube in a few days. What did you like the most? Comment below and share this video on your social media and with your friends. Watch one of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel like this video and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.